we got to wait because of the online, so we've got to start on time. So. It's a different world, isn't it? Our oh, production. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm glad you've joined us here for worship this morning. It's good to see you here. And for those who are watching on TV, I'm glad to have you participating in our worship this morning. What a beautiful week. What a beautiful week has been. The sun's been shining, and uh, I know that uh, myself included, we've already had a busy week, but it's just nice just to <sighs> settle down and breathe and just take some time for each other and for God. So I want to welcome you guys to church this morning. If you are a guest this morning, if you uh, are watching me for the first time, welcome to Hillsborough Avenue Church. And may God bless you in the worship this morning. This morning, I believe we have Laura and Gary Gordon doing our music this morning. May you be blessed. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Hillsborough Seventh-day Adventist Church on this glorious uh, Sabbath day. Um, glorious because the Lord is here with us through the Holy Spirit. Also because there uh, have been some incredible weather here this last week. Um, been uh, quite amazing. It, uh, you can tell us the summer's coming, um, but uh, it's been really nice. But right now, let's uh, invite the Lord into our worship service. Um, the and let's focus today on his on his word on his holy word, that lamp that uh, guides our lives and the light that we can follow. Our first song will be "Give Me the Bible." a glimpse into the future. We see it talks about the, the return of our, our blessed hope, the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus. 
in the meantime, the joy is in the journey. Every day we get to have that chance to, to be with Christ uh, alone. Um, we can find that time to, to be with him. We were just talking um, amongst ourselves here before we started tonight that... Uh, that it's what a what a wonderful words this song this song has it you know, gives us focus to each day seek the Lord so let's sing take time to be holy. <laughs> said that the scriptures are they that speak of him. They, they point to him. And from the scriptures, we can know, we can have confidence in the one in whom we believe. Let's sing that song, I Know Whom I Have Believed. Committed unto him against that day. 
you're welcome to stand and lift up your voices in praise as we sing our opening song. It's called Wake the Song, number 34. seated and have a glorious Sabbath day. We have some business to do this morning, and um, we are looking at um, second readings, and we have three families that uh, are relocating. And we would like to look at them. We have uh, Lori Lefebvre, and I think many of us know her as Lori Brown. And then uh, when she's going to Gaston, SDA Church, we have Alan Craig. Uh, he and his wife moved out to Florida some time ago, so he's transferring his membership to Markham Woods uh, at the uh, Seventh Adventist Church in Longwood, Florida. And then uh, Varro and Mimi Koga, uh, they're not actually moving, but they're transferring their membership to Grants Bay SDA Church at Grants Bay, California. And um, they're going to be doing um, on site, what, satellite um, services. Uh, they've chosen to do that. So we wish them the well with that. And uh, joining us, oh, before I go, I'm sorry. Um, what is your favor with those that are leaving? Uh, if all those in favor, say amen. amen. Thank you. And uh, we have Amy Petarek. Is Amy here today? 
Oh, there you are. Okay. Did I get your last name correct? No? <laughs> anyway, I won't butcher it anymore. But um, she's coming to us from uh, Laurelwood. And most of you know that she's been here for a while. And she is uh, our community services director or leader. And we're glad to have her. And so welcome. And how is, uh, what is the church's favor there? Amen. We say amen. All right. Thank you. And I think I have a couple more things. Oh, I want to remind you that we do have a potluck for the first time in a long time. So we'd encourage you to uh, attend that if you're able or if you're willing. I have one other. It's more of a sad note, but um, those of you who might remember Tom and Sandy Schmidt, uh, Sandy passed away, I think, about a week ago or a week and a half. And uh, Tom is having a memorial service for his wife today from 2 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Um, absolutely have to wear the mask as we're going to be going into his home. And uh, they've asked for um, a limit of five people per time as we visit. So let's keep Tom in our prayers. Uh, if you're not able to go, um, we just keep him, as I said, in, in uh, our prayers. And that's all we have for our business at this time. Uh, Church, I've been, uh, I've been asked to uh, present the mission spotlight today. And as some of you may know, I have kind of a hand in the mission field vicariously. My daughter has been a missionary first to India for 10 years, and now she's uh, overseas again. And so uh, this church has been very supportive of her. And so I thought I'd update you a little bit on, on what's been going on with her. Now, the first really exciting thing is she just completed a 460-page novel about her experiences in India. It's called Hidden Songs of the Himalayas. And it will be published, uh, the target date is May 1st. And as soon as I get a full, now I read the whole thing. I kind of went, I was like her first editor. Then she got a pro. But I, 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 <laughs> I, I was the first editor. And um, so I've read the whole thing. And it's really fascinating, especially when you know Brittany. Because it's just like there's an absolute picture in your mind of what's going on in the book when you're reading it. So um, I'm really excited about it. And I am going to share a chapter or two with you. Uh, I think I might be able to talk Danny into doing a sermon one of these days and uh, reading a chapter or two to you uh, out of the book. It's, it, it's just really, not that I'm prejudiced, but... <laughs> okay, I heard that. All right. So now they, they're, they're in a different country overseas in Africa, and um, they've had a few adventures over there as well. And I think I'll just tell you a couple of uh, stories that, that dad gets to hear before the newsletter goes out. So um, for quite a while, um, months, there were some neighbor kids that would throw rocks at my grandkids. Not a good thing. Grandpa wasn't over there to deal with this. So, so I had to, to give advice over the phone. But, but they actually worked it out very well. So um, they, they were going to move. They, they were, they were think, thinking of moving out of town because they just couldn't deal with uh, what was going on. And so, but eventually, um, they uh, went over to visit the parents. And um, in, in the Christian spirit, they asked them, you know, is, is there anything you need? Is there any? Well, okay, a little background. So, you know, COVID, right? Everybody's out of a job. So the husband was doing odd jobs around town, making enough to, you know, put food on the table, minimal clothes, but no extra money at all. And, uh, and uh, Brittany was asking, well, is there anything you need? And they're going, oh, no, no, no. And then the, the wife said, well, my son broke his bike and we can't afford to fix it. Well, now David does bike repair. Dave, David's Brittany's husband. And um, so, so Brittany goes, can I take the bike? And they're like, oh, no, 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 let me take the bike, it'll be fine. So he takes the bike, David fixes it for probably a dollar, right? Takes it back, and the little boy changed. The little boy is now 
Micaiah and Peter, my grandkids, best defender, right? It just brought faith and humanity back into his life and changed his whole personality. So that's, you, you know, you can be mad or you can be Christian. Eh. Sometimes, I, okay, I'm not saying that mad is always wrong, but usually it is. So, um, so anyway, it really worked out for the better. And then uh, they started building a relationship with this person. And she brought over this, this giant crochet hook. Now, I don't, I don't crochet, but, but apparently you can make giant rugs out of giant, with uh, rags and a giant crochet hook. So they did that came back over and there was this rug that filled up most of the living room that they had made with it. So they put that to good use and so they talked a little bit. And the latest thing that's going on is that they don't have a washing machine and, and the wife's hands were becoming bad from doing the whole family's laundry by hand, right? So they went out and got a second hand washing machine and that's due to be delivered to them today tomorrow the next day so so that's just kind of a little that's that's how you show christianity to those that don't know christianity you know you don't you don't it's not always theology first it's it's action it's relationships and the theology will come later almost naturally all right um story number two uh, visiting neighbors and um, with with the Micaiah and some much younger neighbor kids, and they were ornery, might be a good word, and um, not very engaging with uh, Micaiah. So they sat down. Micaiah, uh, Micaiah is ten. Yeah, give or take a year. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> give or take a year, she's done. Um, so she, they sat down, uh, Brittany and Micaiah, and said, well, what can we do? What can we do to remedy the situation? And so Micaiah said, I'm going to bring over a bunch of toys and sit down and play with these guys. So one of the things she brought over was a chalkboard, and they fell into school. And, and Micaiah was the teacher, right, with the chalkboard, and the kids really seemed to like it. So they got back home and they decided that Micaiah would teach the kids English as their pretend teacher, right? And so everybody's loving that. And that's just a little insight into how to, how to put the Jesus's character before those that don't know Jesus's character. Because, you know, if you don't know um, what you're missing, why would you ever want to acquire it, right? All right, so that's about it for me. I know we need to move on, but uh, I promise you, I'll, as soon as I get the book, you'll get a couple of chapters, all right? Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. This is a children's story, but it's for the big children too. So we're going to talk about truth today. What is truth? Truth is a thing that is true. A, a thing that is true. Well, let me start over again. A thing is true if it is a fact. So what is a fact? Well, this is a picture of a stuffed bear. You agree? Is that a stuffed bear? And it's a picture of it, right? So we're not touching it. That is a fact. So that's true. Now, this is a picture of a stuffed bear with glasses, right? Now that's a fact, right? So it's true. That is true. So this month is April, and April 1st is already passed, but on the 1st of April, people like to tease each other, and they tell each other things that, well, Sometimes they tell the things that are not true, but sometimes they make people believe things, and they might say it's true, but they make people believe that it's something scary or wrong. Well, there was a radio announcer, and he was talking on the radio, and on April 1st, 
he decided to do something called April Fools with people. And he decided to scare a bunch of people. So he thought it was funny. He said that their local water supply had become contaminated with a terrible poison and it caused all sorts of problems. And the contamination, he said, it was contaminated with dihydrogen monoxide. And people got scared. And they started calling the water department. And they started calling the police department. What can we drink? When is it going to be safe? What is this poison? What if I drank it and got sick? What, how am I going to know? And you know what? Dihydrogen monoxide is just another word for water. <laughs> so the water was contaminated with water. So he really didn't tell a lie because H2O is to hydrogen monoxide. It's two hydrogens and monoxide, which is water. Um, but he made a lot of people think that it was something really bad and something scary. And he actually ended up getting fired for it because it caused a big, big uproar in town. So how can we know the truth? When you're listening to the radio or you're listening to your friend talking, how can we know they're telling us the truth? That is truth. The Bible is truth. And I have my Bible right here. And if you read your Bible, your Bible's truth. But some people say, how can we trust our Bible? How do we know that the Bible is true? Well, I'm here to tell you that if you listen to Pastor Danny today, he's going to share a story of proof because thousands of years ago, God told Daniel some stories and those came true long after Daniel died. So they're prophecies and they're true. And we know that if that's true, then our Bible is true. And God is truth, and God is in the Bible. So I want you to go ahead and listen today to Pastor Danny, and I want you to remember that when you don't know what's true, remember to trust in God, because he is truth. Amen. Now is the time when we come before the Lord's throne and petition him in prayer and uh, it's one of my most favorite times and uh, it's very humbling to be up here to do this for the church and for the church family but uh, for those who are able I would invite you to kneel and uh, of course I'll stand and uh, offer the prayer for the congregation almighty God gracious God again we have another Sabbath day and uh, we praise you and thank you for these days. Father, I think all week of all the activities that uh, I'm involved in and even my church family is involved in. And uh, I see some of the things that uh, are going on in their lives. And I'm privileged to pray on their behalf. And so we thank you for this day, Lord. Uh, I always look forward to it that I can come apart from the world and that we too as a congregation can come apart from the world and dedicate our lives to you and rest with you Lord uh, we thank you for the incredible blessings that you have given us and Father we also lift up well right now we want to lift up Tom Schmidt um, Sandy passed away and uh, we know Tom is um probably uh, experiencing a lot of pain in his heart but uh, I know they're a very dear couple they've been members of our church for a long time so we want to keep Tom before you and I know there are others Lord many others that have special prayer requests and even have praises and um, I know they silently raise them up to you this morning and so, Father, again, these things we pray in the holy name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. 
Amen. Did she take my remote control? <laughs> Could someone tell Teresa I need that remote control? <laughs> Technology, right? I wish you snap, snap, finger, finger, clap, clap. Thank you, Timmy. Appreciate it. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Matthew 24, 35. Living in the Northwest, if people come to visit you here in Oregon or Washington, you almost have to take them to Monoma Falls. That's kind of where you take them. If it's a nice spring day, maybe you could take them to the Rose Garden, right? Right? And a beautiful view. You can see the Willamette. You can see Mount Hood, Mount Adams. You can see St. Helens. There's some beautiful places you could take them to. And you want to show them the beauty of the Northwest. Growing up in California, Southern California, <clears throat> there's also a place you take them. Unfortunately, it's not as nice as Multnomah Falls. But if you're young, it's somewhere you go. And if you're in Southern California, you always end up going to Disneyland. That, that's the place you, you take people. You take people to Disneyland. So I remember when I was young, we'd go to Disneyland for the first time. It was a magical place, they say, you know, right? You had, you know, had these little castles and princesses. You know, I, I did not know there were princesses giving autographs. I did not even know that existed until, like, my kids were growing up. Like, they had that. But, you know, that's what they had. I, I, but they had rides like, like Space Mountain and all these wonderful things, right? And you still remember your first... I mean, my favorite one was what? That um, It's a Small World, right? You guys remember? Eh, it's a Small World. Okay, okay, maybe you don't know. <laughs> but for those who do know, you, you remember that little thing that goes around the castle, right? And I was talking to this gentleman yesterday. Um, he says, he says I, go to, I went to Disneyland every year. I'm like, Wow every year. But now I go to Disney World every year. Like, wow, you, you really love this thing. They call it the happiest, happiest place in the world. And I must admit, there's a lot of happy people there. They're happy to be there and experiencing all the wonders and joys of Disneyland and having a great time. But there is something I always are, is fascinated with Disneyland or, or good times in general. In the world, it always ends it always ends you have to leave disneyland and for those who remember you used all your e-tickets and your b t you guys still remember those things way back then the c tickets you've used all your tickets at disneyland and you always have to go out of the gate you have your souvenirs you get your bunny ears or no little you know mice ears and whatnot and you're leaving the place and you're like oh man the show is over and and I, I ask myself this question. This world has a lot of fun things to do, but the interesting thing about fun, it always ends. And in a sense, you have to go back to it to get fun again, but it's never consistent. It never lasts. It always comes down to an unfruitful end. Let me tell you about something. There is a place called heaven. There's also a castle there. There's also wonderful animals and angels there and beauty far beyond anyone's imagination. But here is one key differentiator about this place and Disneyland. Heaven 
never ends. It is a place that will exist forever. It is a place that we can be and never have to go home. Why? Because we are home. There are two realities, I believe, in this world. There's a reality that the world is trying to prepare us for, but there's a reality that God has prepared for us. And my friends, the title of this sermon is called Realities, but I believe in the book of Daniels, there is a wake-up call to the true reality rather than the false reality that exists in this world. Could it be possible that we are living in a false reality? Do you know that 99% of the world <clears throat> believe we came from some sort of cosmic accident? 99%. They're like, oh yeah, it happened. There was some explosion billions and billions of years ago. And out of this explosion, out of chaos came kind of a swirling mass. And suddenly some life popped out of some pond. And as this life crawled out of a pond, some monkeys came somewhere down the road. And these monkeys became human beings. And this is what we believe. This is what we believe. This is what we teach in our schools. And this is almost fact that we came from this Big bang. And I asked my question to you this. This is very important because this goes to the core of who we are. And my question to you is this. How did we get here? You ever ask yourself that question? How did you get here? This is a reality. This is a reality check. How did you get here? Well, obviously, mom and dad. Well, keep on going. Where did mom and dad come from? Grandpa and grandma. Keep on going. Where did it all come from? And if you go all the way back, you have to come from somewhere. Believe it or not, there is a geneticist. A geneticist. All he does is study DNA and genes. And he studied genetics. And guess what? He, he, he kind of followed genetics and their how they're mutated or where they went. And he found, he found that all human genetics go down to three starting points. And about 4,000 years ago, they all come down to three points. This is genetics. This is science, okay? This is science. And he said there are three starting points for every human being. We're all, we're all related. Guess what? The Bible says, guess what? We are all related. And the Bible says we are created by whom? By God. So there are two realities here. There's a world of reality that'll tell you that you are an accident. That there is no cause and no purpose. You exist for only to be here. And after you've reached your existence, you go to Netherland and you cease to exist. But there's a second reality. I believe that God is trying to tell all of us this morning that the true reality is that you are children of God. That God exists. And the number one way I know God exists, you are here. Yes? You are here. You are thinking. You are alive. That tells me that there is a God in heaven who created this world. In Daniel chapter 2, we read a story. It says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, you remember from chapter 1, he's the king of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded the magicians and the enchanters and the sorcerers and the child Chaldeans. He summoned to tell them his king his dreams. So they came to him and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know this dream. So King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He said, something troubled me. And he called all the wise men to his presence and said, explain to me this dream. And all the magicians couldn't. And Daniel came to explain this dream to Nebuchadnezzar. But you see, God wanted to show Nebuchadnezzar the true reality of the universe. 
And by showing Daniel this dream, God is going to show to Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in this world. So Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember the dream. He asked the magicians to tell the dream. They couldn't. He said, fine, you guys are all liars and cheaters anyway. I'm going to kill you all. And Daniel said, no, God knows the answer. And then Daniel tells the dream that Nebuchadnezzar couldn't even remember. And what did Nebuchadnezzar dream? He dreamt of a statue. For those who remember the statue, remember the statue? He he dreamt of a statue, and the statue had the head of gold. You're good students. The arms and chest of silver. The thighs of brass. The legs of iron. The feet of iron and clay, a mixture. And finally, what? The last piece. People often remember the statue, but they forget there's one last important piece. The stone that was not cut from human hands that came and destroyed the entire statue. So Daniel began not only to show the dream, he interpreted the dream. So Nebuchadnezzar sat and listened to this interpretation. And he said to Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold that you have dreamed is the kingdom of Babylon. So you are the head of gold. And, but after you will come another kingdom. And then Daniel began to see into the future what was to come. But let me ask you a question about God. God is timeless, Yes. He is timeless. For God, the future is not really future. The future to him can be what? Present. So for, for this prophecy, it's not God foretelling the future. What God has seen, he's seen the future and he's telling to Daniel. Does that make sense? He knows what happens in this world. He knows what happens. He knows what will happen. And now he's going to begin to tell to Daniel. He says, after you will come another kingdom of silver. And that silver kingdom is Persia or Media and Persia. And we know in history, and we will discuss this in a couple sermons down the road, that the Persians conquered Babylon just like the kingdom here. The Persians were conquered, right? By Alexander the Great, the Bronze Age. It was a, it was a very quick conquering, conquering. Alexander came quickly, conquered Persia, all, almost all the way to India. He was called the Great for a reason, one of the most intelligent generals in the history of, history of this world. But his kingdom also fell because he died at a very early age. If you know your history, he died to the next kingdom, Became what? Rome. We know that the fourth kingdom that we represent in this, in this image is Rome. And finally, the last little bit, we have iron and clay. There are traces of, is there, is there traces of the Roman Empire today? Yeah? You ever heard of the Holy Roman Empire turned into the Holy Roman what? Church. The remnants of Rome even, even last today. But the Bible tells us there will be clay and iron. They'll never come together. There will never be this wonderful, great kingdom again. And finally, the last but least, the rock that comes to this world and destroys the world of kingdoms. And that kingdom is what? Kingdom of God. This, my friends, is a reality. That this world has a limit. A time limit. This is what is very important to understand. This world has an end. People will say, well, pastor, I heard I was watching science shows and I heard our suns get really big and swallow up the earth one day. And if you go a couple trillion years ahead, um, everything will just kind of cease to exist and there'll be black space. Or Maybe some of you are just worried even from 100 years. I don't know. We're always worried about what might be. But what I'm trying to tell you, this reality comes to an end. And that, my friend, is the news that the God wants to tell us. This reality that we are living right now, this reality 
our, our making, our living, our doing, our daily business will come to an end. What God wanted to show Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, your kin- kingdom that you think are so great, comes to an end. It finishes. The reality is that what is on this world is what they call temporal. Temporal means limited by time. This world is limited by time. It will cease to exist. So what God is trying to say is this. Don't live in this world. Live for which world? The next one to come. My friends, this is the reality that God is trying to tell every single human being. That there is a God who created you and me. And this God is coming back. And this is not fantasy. This is true. This painting by Harry Anderson is one of my favorite paintings. It's a painting of our Lord coming down from heaven to take his people home. Yes, it's a painting. Yes, it's a picture that I've seen for many, many years. But my friends, one day this will happen. This will happen. I will bet my life on it. And how do I know this? Because Jesus said so. Before Jesus left this world, he told his people, I will come back again for you. In John 14, he says, if, if I wasn't going to come back, I wouldn't have told you so. Yes? And there's mansions in heaven for me. With, with your names on it, and all of heaven is yours if you'd be willing to come. My friends, this is the reality that we must start living in. My friends, but if this is the reality, we begin to have different paths. In Matthew 6, 24, he says these words, no man, this is Jesus speaking, can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one or love the other, or else you will be hold to the one or despise the other. You cannot serve God or mammon. There is an there issue in our world. There's a reality of making money, making a living, and surviving in this world. Yes? That's a reality. Trust me. There's a reality. You get bills every month, just like I do, right? Every month you get those bills. For some reason, they never forget about me, okay? And for some reason, every month, that same bill goes higher and higher. But that reality is not the reality that God wants us to be part of. The true reality is that we are going where? Home. And if we are going home, God says, what are going we do about it? In this world... Nothing is certain but what? Death and taxes. So says Benjamin Franklin. It is true. A certainty in the world, there is death. And this government will tax you to no end. My friends, there's a certainty in this world that we all die. Yes, does that make sense? There's a certainty in this world that everything, there's a limit in time. We will end. And my friend, because of that, they've come up with a phrase. Maybe you've heard this phrase. Kids do this while they're jumping off a 40-foot cliff. They'll say, YOLO! Right? You you, you ever seen? No, no, maybe not. Okay? But these young people, they're like, they'll be doing crazy things. Like skydiving off cliffs with little tiny parachute things, okay? Or, I don't know, I just do just a lot of things that I would never even want to do. But they say YOLO, which means, maybe you never heard this term, you only live once. So that's their attitude. This is their only reality. And if this is their only reality, and they've only lived once, guess what? They're going to do everything they want to do. They'll do everything they want to do, and they, they won't be restricted by rules or restricted by anything. There was a famous, famous um, Satan worshiper, okay, um, that lived in England. And now his name is escaping me. Um, yeah, I'll come, the train will come back around. But his, 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 his motto was, do thou wilt. 
Oh, Alistair Crawley. Okay? And that was his motto, do thou wilt. Okay, that was the thing. He says, do it. Feel it? Do it. Want it? Do it. That was the thing. Anything that you feel like you're doing, do it because guess what? You only live once. Well, he only did live once. He died eh, a little later in his life. A heroin addict and his life ended. But there's another way to live. This world is what? Not my home. What? I'm just passing through. My friends, there's another reality that God wants to tell us. That this world is not the end all. That this world is not where we live. Our world is the next one. My friends, and if our mind is thinking the next one, my friends, there should be one conclusion. This should be a conclusion. How to be sure you are saved. Yes, if this world ends, it will end. The Bible has told us. Did you get that, did you get that prophecy? This world will end. That is for certain. This world will end, and there will be a second kingdom set up. So my friends, here is the issue. If this world ends and there's a future to come, your number one issue to be is, should be this. How can I make sure I'm in the next one? Does that make sense? Shouldn't that be it? Shouldn't that be our concern? Because of this world, it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor. It doesn't matter. But this world will end. Our only concern is this. What can we do to make sure we're in the next kingdom to come? Amen? My friends, this is why God is trying to wake us up. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 to 22, read these words. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever. Did you catch that? Is God a limited God? How is God? He's what? Ever. Did you see that? He's a God of eternity, right? To whom belong what? Wisdom and might. Look at this. He changes the times and seasons. Do you see it? God is saying, God controls everything here. He removes kings. He sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So God is doing all these things. He reveals what? The deep and the hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. This is our God. He dwells in the light. He knows what is darkness. He knows what is truth. He has seen the, I would say, the propaganda of this world. Do you know the propaganda of this world? To tell you, go to school well, why should I go to school? Oh, because you want to get a good job. Oh, okay. Oh, and why should I get a good job? Well, you'll get married. you get two dogs, you know. And if you work hard, you can retire by your age 65. Oh, cool, I can retire at 65. And then what? Well, if you make a lot of money, then you can play golf for the rest of your life. Until maybe you're till 80, then you, they don't tell you this part until you die. The world has us fooled. The world has us thinking the wrong reality, that this is everything. And God is saying, no, this is not everything. The future is everything. And God has given us a blessing, not only in the future, but I also know this, when we live for the right reasons, we can live today for the right reasons, amen? When we know where we're going, we can live today like we're going tomorrow. And we can live the way God intended. My friends, Christian insight into Bible prophecy is an important part of a Christian heritage. And Daniel, I told you, the book of Daniel is a book for the what? The last people, right? 
The book of Daniel is, is, for, is for people, not just Christians. It's for everybody. It, it's, it's an opportunity for Christians or non-Christians alike to open their Bibles, an insight to Bible prophecy. And what is Bible prophecy? It is this. It's a wake-up call. The Bible prophecy is a wake-up call. Help people to wake up that the reality of the future world is going to overwhelm the reality of this present world. My friends, this world is coming, will come to an end. Fact. Yes? As we believe that we are not cosmic accidents, as we believe that we are created by God, a higher power, we also believe that this world will come to an end. But my friends, it's not just a message for us. It's a message for them too. Because you see, as a pastor, I have a great concern. There are many people in this world who are asleep. They don't know that there's another reality coming. I'm afraid that people will be asleep when Jesus does come in the sky above. I'm afraid that people will be lost because no one told them, hey, there's something better. There's something better and we should get ready for it. You know, our famous little author said, there'll be many people lost, but you know why they were lost? Because no one ever shared them the truth. Do you hear that? They weren't necessarily bad people. They were just never heard the truth. No one ever decided to tell them, hey, there's something else out there. There's a better world to come. My brothers and sisters, where are you going? Where are you going? Do you want to be with God for eternity, if that is your desire, let's go there. Let's go there. This world, let them do their thing. YOLO. Let them jump off cliffs. Let them do their own little wonderful things. But my brothers and sisters, we are his sheep. We follow his words. And we ask, God, where do we go from here? Brothers and sisters, Daniel chapter 2 is telling us that God knows and sees and understands all. And his greatest desire is this. He wants, what is this? He wants no one to be lost, yes? Did you know that? Did you know that God wants everyone to be saved? Did you know that? He wants every human being to be saved. God is not trying to keep people out of heaven. He wants to get every single person possible into the next kingdom. And that is our God, who loves you, who loves this world, will not give up on us. And he's holding back. I believe this. Jesus hasn't come yet because he's holding back because he wants to save every last person who's sleeping, to get them up, wake them up, and finally take them home. We got work to do, don't we? We got work to do. We got to love people, wake people up, say, hey, Jesus is coming back. Praise God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your message in Daniel chapter 2. That you've given us a Bible prophecy. That you've given us a timeline for this world. This world does come to an end. But Father, when that world ends, the future world, the real world begins. And I just pray, Father, that every single one of us might walk into that kingdom hand in hand. Knowing that we have fought the good fight, we have walked the walk, and we have entered the kingdom that you've asked us to come. So be with us today. Not only be with us, be with those people who are outside of this church. May we be people to share the good news that we don't have to stay in this world, and there is a future for us. So we thank you, and we ask for your spirit's leading. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for sharing this morning with us. May God bless you in this week. For all those who've come to church today, there is a fellowship meal that we prepared. This is our first fellowship meal in a year.
Yay. So, um, you're welcome. We have um, some food prepared for you. Stick around. Have some fellowship. May God bless you. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Slept the whole time?